Good evening. I'd like to call the City of Mount Vernon City Council meeting for March 22nd, 2023. Yeah, that's right, to order. <laughs> the time is now 7 p.m. Would you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Item C is our roll call of our council members. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Councilmember Beaton? Here. Councilmember Brocksmith? Here. Councilmember Correas? Here. Councilmember Hudson? Here. Councilmember Holst? Here. Councilmember Molinar? Here. Councilmember Morales? Here. <laughs> Thank you. Under community comments, it's a review of emails from the public, and I'll ask uh, Peter if there's been any emails sent in. No emails. All right. Thank you. Item two is our public comments. If anyone is here for public comment, you're welcome to come to the podium. Please state your name Please. and city of residence and comments about three minutes or so. My name is Brian Hill. I live at 1618 North 26th Street. I am, by definition, normally a pain in the butt where it comes to city council members, but thanks to your mm. mayor, I've been content to watch from afar. Well, that stops tonight. I come to see how just how many people hate wildlife. Apparently, word has gotten around and it's been in the newspaper that you plan to build a bu an apartment complex behind Summer Glen Apartments on wetland in an area where wildlife travel through. There have been deer traveling through. There's a hawk that lives in the trees, squirrels all around, birds all around. Not to mention the fact that there's a fish run that runs right in through the center of the field. I don't know who came up with this cockamamie idea, but they sure as heck didn't talk to any of the people around there. I did, nobody. But nobody wants this apartment to go in. I grew up in Southern California, and I got to tell you, you people up here don't know how good you have it. You got to go to a big city, and I'm talking of city in an area bigger than Seattle, to realize just how good you have it. You drive two minutes, and you're out in the country here. I can see the hills from my kitchen. If you want to put a, an apartment in there, you better be prepared for gra graffiti. You better be prepared for animals trespassing through it. You better be pre prepared for challenges because it is wetlands back there. And from what I have been told by previous city councils, the wetlands tri triumph over anything. That field as it is now, is not being upkept. Last year, there was a fire out there, and you want to put an apartment complex out there? That's the stupidest idea I've heard in a long time. Whoever decided on that idea should have to live out there, and they should have be forced to talk to everyone out there. Because right now, the city council's flying blind into what the people want. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. All right, anyone else for comment? Seeing none, we'll move along. Under our consent agenda, we have items A, B, C, and D. It's the approval of council meeting minutes, payroll checks, depo uh, direct deposits, wire transfers, claims, and agreements 4381 through 4386. I'd move the adoption of the consent agenda. All right, thank you. Second. Motion by Mark and a second by Mary. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries, thank you. Under reports tonight, we have our finance and parks and enrichment services report, and that is Council Member Mary Hudson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we met this evening at six o'clock here in these chambers. After approving our meeting minutes from last, um, from February 22nd, uh, the first thing we went into was a, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Director Valeski gave, talking to us about the finance department. Uh, he gave us a proprietary funds update, um, told us about the fund reserves and all of our utility funds and their associated capital funds and the equipment rental and reserve fund. 
All funds are currently at what was expected during the budgeting process, and overall the balances are in good shape for future planned capital investment needs. And then we talked about the city debt update. Um, under state law, voters may approve general obligation debt issues up to 7.5% of, of assessed valuation, split 2.5% uh, each to general purpose, parks, open space, and utilities. But currently, we have no debt with parks and open space and are using only 8.4% of the allowable debt for the utilities, which is at about $11.5 million. With general purpose debt, the city is using 8.6%. Uh, percent of allowable debt with the fire station remodel bonds of 11.7 million when the city re receives the federal TIFIA loan for the Mount Vernon Library Commons project then the city will be using approximately 27.7 percent of the allowable debt amount of 136.4 million overall the city is in very good shape with the amount of debt it will be carrying we also got uh, a little sneak peek on sales tax revenues through February uh, uh, actually through March they're up 279,723 from last year at this time uh, the city has collected over 2.4 million in the first three months which is over 20 percent six percent of the overall budgeted amount of 9.2 million then we had a um, parks and enrichment services update from director burner the first thing we talked about was the um, PUD field update we're moving forward with the option of upgrading Hillcrest Park and Edgewater Park to accommodate the fields that we will be, um, will be lost at, at PUD. Hillcrest will have uh, a new soccer field and Edgewater Park will have a new soccer field and an overlay baseball field or vice versa, whichever way you want to look at it. The city is asking PUD to pay the city $200,000 and install the new two-inch water line and meter at Hillcrest Park. The city will then do the work through staff and contractors to revise the fields at Hillcrest Park and Edgewater Park. The, and also, the new field rental policy has, pr has provided field use for five new youth organizations, which is pretty exciting. People that haven't used it in the past are coming now and asking to see if they can get on the schedule, so that's, that's really exciting. I uh, hope you've all received your new spring-summer activity guide. Uh, they were mailed to households over the last few weeks. Um, and one of our new events this year is Earth Day, and the event will be held at Hillcrest Park on Saturday, April 22nd. Uh, and also we got a, a little bit of a peek at um, some of the new banners that we, our, our Arts Commission um, asked for people to give us submissions for new banners along the river, along the river part. And 81 submissions were received, 46 submissions were chosen, and the banners will be installed along the Riverwalk and should be up around mid-April. They're quite lovely. Uh, the ones we saw were, were just so pretty and so diverse that we're, I'm really excited to see how everything else comes out. Um, we had a small um, update from the mayor, just general information about a trip to Washington, D.C., um, a little bit library, so pretty much just a, an overall update and we actually adjourned our meeting at 6 30. all right thank you next up is committee report for development services committee and cats council member melissa beaton thank you mayor <coughs> thank you mayor so we met in here last uh wednesday evening march 15th and first up on our agenda were was a continued discussion on our design standards review um, <clears throat> what we're looking at doing is modifying what the design review board looks like in downtown mount vernon we are studying doing nothing, uh, keeping it as is, losing it, or option four is to move and modify it. Option four would look like it is now part of the pre-application process. There's community uh, involvement and input. So it would look something like this. Step one, the property owner reaches out to the city and the city outlines the entire process, which includes design review. The owner, the owner is given the application forms and the meeting is required as part of the process. Um, the step two is pre-application. The meeting is held prior to submitting the application. Um, the owner or the agent schedules the meeting and invites the Mount Vernon Downtown Association or members of the downtown uh, to the meeting. The owner takes minutes at these meetings um, and the attendees are asked for guided feedback. So then those minutes and feedback are submitted to the city. Three questions are being proposed. The first one would be, were the project design elements presented? 
were you able to provide input regarding the design elements and what suggestions or advice do you have for the applicant regarding those design elements? Step three comes the application process. The materials are sub submitted to the city. This includes the application forms, the drawings, the project description, the meeting minutes, and the guided feedback responses, if any. Step four is the notice of application. The application is deemed complete. The city creates a notice of application. That is then sent to the stakeholders, which would include the applicant, the downtown members, whomever gave guided feedback. That includes, by law, a 14-day comment period. Feedback is then given to staff, to staff. Step five is the permit review process. Staff reviews uh, the, and checks the project for compliance with the codes in our design standards handbook. Public comment in, helps inform the, re, the review process. After the decision, uh, based on Mount Vernon code, there is a 10-day reconsideration and then there is also, after that, 14-day appeal period to the um, hearing examiners. So that was that discussion. And then we moved on to our 2023 docket items, where um, there are currently 17 to 18 projects that the city is looking to uh, tackle over the next year. Some of those include finalizing our shoreline master plan, a land clearing ordinance, uh, a sign code so that's what's going to be going on for 2023 and we're told that we might actually get all of those done so that's exciting news um, then we had some de department updates our building official is retiring at the end of April so there is a job posting on the city's website uh, we've had many permitting and process improvements a uh, couple ideas some of them are we're stream streamlining the process you can now apply online 24-7, uh, business licenses and things like that. Uh, some of the staff members in development services use a GPS receiver, I believe, when they're out in the field. And that receiver, the operating system, and the desk software is at end of life. So we're looking at replacing that. Uh, then we were given some legislative and project updates. Uh, one of the legislate, well, there's several legislative several bills that we're looking at um, some of the things we're we're already doing accessory dwelling units and things like that uh, then we were given a project update there is the Glenmore plat which consists of 26 acres 36 lots 31 of those are single-family lots and four duplex lots one multi-family lot with uh, 36 units there is a critical area permit in the works and that project is moving forward. Martha's Place is, uh, we received an update on that. That's in its final stages here in the next month or two. There is a life safety issue with some underground, with underground fire permits. So that's between the developer and the contractor. So they're working on that. Cities um, have, have seen an uptick in solar panel permits. Um, unfortunately, what's happening is that there are numerous installations in the past year where the contractor is not getting the permits that they are required to get. So uh, we're working with the fire department and the contractor. Homeowners are caught in the middle, and LNI is aware of this, and so stay tuned on that. Uh, we're going to see Zipley uh, Fiber out and about because they're uh, exercising their right-of-way permits, and so it's just that time of year. And then we received uh, an update on the Mount Vernon Christian School and their master plan, and I think we ended the meeting around 7.15. All right. Thank you very much. Um, under reports, uh, item B is our council member comments. Any council member comments this evening? Okay, we'll move along. Uh, under Mayor's report, just a couple of things. Um, our legislature is in session, and they are scheduled to be done, I believe it's April 24th, if I'm going to remember the right day. And uh, But the, right now, they are working on not only passage of bills in both houses, but also the budget. And so we, as the city, have asked for one more allocation from the state capital budget for the Mount Vernon Library Commons, and that's $2 million just to get us to that finish line. 
So what we're asking is, is if our community is willing to help us out, contact either the 10th or the 40th legislative district. That's wherever you live in the city. You could go on the legislature, legislature website, which is leg.wa.gov, and you can even put in your address and find your legislators. But we'd really love uh, uh, to send letters of support saying we'd really love this help from the state. Please work on that $2 million for us. And any good thoughts and requests uh, to our legislators would be very helpful. Um, you can also, if that's the easiest way, just ledge.wa.gov. You can also type in their emails, which actually is probably a little more um, complicated to explain in this report. But you could do, say, ron.mazal.ledge.wa.gov. But go directly to the website. They'll connect you. It's easier. All right. Um, and then just a construction update about the Commons Project. If you haven't been downtown recently, you'll start seeing the, uh, the poured concrete columns uh, coming up out of the ground, which is exciting. Um, Lighted continues to work on those footings around the perimeter of the site and the vertical column. So you'll see several of those around the entire site. The intersection at 3rd and Kincaid has finally been opened back up to allow for both lanes of traffic to turn left or east from 3rd onto Kincaid Street and make the U-turn again. And so um, thank you for the patience on that. There was a lot of utility work that required that closure. So um, that's open again in time for tulip traffic. And then just as soon as those concrete uh, footings and columns are poured, then the, um, just the, the, the nudge out into some of those travel lanes on 2nd and 3rd will get start, start being pulled back as well. So it won't be as disruptive downtown as far as traffic goes. Uh, the project has received several visitors in the last few weeks. We've had three visits from Puget Sound Energy from their senior leadership to come take a look at the project and how they could collaborate with us. And we welcomed Representative Rick Larson, um, did a video about the project for his social media. So we're thrilled that um, they came to visit and uh, help support the project. As always, you can find more information on the city website, mountvernonwa.gov, including a live webcam where you can watch all the activity happening live. All right, item D tonight is a committee agenda request. Is there any committee agenda requests from council members? All right, seeing none, we have no unfinished business. And under new business tonight, our first up is our Skagit Valley Tulip Festival po poster presentation something we look forward to every single year. And so I'll have Peter Donovan make the introductions. Thank you, Mayor. Hi, Council. Yeah, every year we look forward to a visit from uh, Skagit Valley Tulip Festival Executive Director Cindy Burge. So uh, welcome, Cindy, here tonight to present the 2023 poster design. Um, also, maybe you would want to ask her her favorite question, which is, what is the exact date and time <laughs> that the flowers will bloom? <laughs> welcome, Cindy. <laughs> There we have it on the screen. And here it is. It's so gorgeous. Ready to hang up Love it. somewhere <coughs> in the city. Love it. I think everyone will really like it. Tulip Festival is going to be great this year. It is so wonderful to have things much more back to normal. The Canadian borders open. We have. Uh, been able to have our Tulip Ambassador event. In fact, uh, yesterday we spent the day down in Olympia meeting the governor, doing a tour of the Secretary of State's office, meeting our legislators from the area with our child ambassadors. They've already decided how that even though they're two different ages that they could both be 14 at the same time and apply to be pages. Oh, so <laughs> I thought that was delightful. We're, we're getting that, that service bug in them and that would be good. Um, we have the PACAR open house back that hasn't been up here since 2019. And so we're looking forward to those uh, several thousand people that will go through PACAR. Um, and we've done some really interesting partnerships with the Skagit Tourism Bureau this year. They have <coughs> partnered with us to do a passport program. It's a digital passport program, and you earn points. So you earn points for going to the tulip farms. You earn points for going to the restaurant, to a restaurant. You earn points to going to the parade, to the street fair. And you can use those points to come to my office and get a special sticker. It's a holographic sticker. It's pretty cool looking. Or you can enter to win a restaurant gift certificate drawing. 
or you can enter to win the grand prize drawing of uh, a night in La Conner at the La Conner Country End and um, a restaurant there for dinner. And so we're really excited with that. In the pre-signups, we already had um, nearly 600 people sign up in just about a month, and that was really gratifying. That'll give us data. We're hopeful that it gives us lots of data to say where, where, where are our tourists going, where are our visitors going, where are they coming from. And uh, it'll also give them the chance to go out and explore everything a little bit yeah. because there's over 70 different entries on that passport program. Mm -hmm. So that will be a really good test to see how well they move around the county and what they find. And we're just excited to be able to partner with the Tourism Bureau there have, we'll have um, three more passport programs that they're going to implement <coughs> on the visitsgadgetvalley.com website. So to me, it's a really good partnership, a really strong entry for them for that. Then we've also, and um, the city also helped us with this, um, got some extra funding through them and our uh, lodging tax applications around the county. And we hired a media company called Swell Media, and they've been helping us expand our social media posts, our presence online, working to try and make sure that we're out there and saying to people, hey, come on back. We, we've missed you with, with the, the past uh, since uh, 2020 because we've noticed kind of fits and starts of whether people are remembering to come back to the Skagit Valley. So we're very excited about that. And we've added a fourth grower. We now have four different places for people to go and pay admission, go in and see tulips planted just for them to walk around and see. And that's really exciting because we had been down for to two for a really long time. And then we went to three and now we're at four. And so it's going to be a lot of fun to see what Tulip Valley Farms has to offer. Um, they describe what they've planted and folks will say, well, me, well, what is it going to look like? I don't know. <laughs> we'll all find out together because literally the bulbs were planted last fall. And so that's going to be just a brand new venture. And then, of course, Tulip Town has a lovely planting um, spot, and they've, they've revamped some of their, their things out there. So that'll be fun to see. And uh, Rusengarda, you might notice that the tulip fields look different this year. They've implemented a new planting method and for them and it is rows about this wide hmm. and tons of bulbs in those rows and the advantage is is they can plant more bulbs in less acreage it enhances the environment because it's a net system uh, it's a little bit different than what tulip town uses but it's a net system so when it's pulled up out of the ground it shakes the dirt off mm -hmm. and they don't have to transport dirt it saves on labor costs of just, there's fewer fields to dig, fewer, all, all of the man hours. And um, it's, it's exciting. Um, probably the best spot to see, please just drive by, no stopping, <laughs> is right across from Mexico Cafe on the west side. Mm -hmm. There's a beautiful field going to be in there, and all the tulips are up, and you can really see how those rows are laid out. And to me, it's fascinating to kind of see. Oh, well, it's changed again. So now all the pictures we had of all those delightful rows, we're going to have to get new pictures of <laughs> big rows. So that's exciting. So we're all set um, to get the Tulip Festival started. And in answer to the question, there will be tulips blooming April 1 through 30th. <laughs> there will likely be red tulips and purple tulips and yellow tulips and white tulips and all sorts of other tulip colors blooming during that time period. <laughs> And we're suggesting that folks plan on coming right in the middle of the month. Mm -hmm. Because where we're at right now, that looks about right. And uh, as we always hedge our bets, so stay tuned for weather. Because uh, <laughs> we have had snow on Street Fair weekend before. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll hope that doesn't happen, but weather always can get us. And now to the poster. It's uh, the poster artist is <coughs> Carrie Clavendatcher. And Carrie has created a lovely poster. Um, it has a savanna sparrow per perching on tulips, and they really do that. Um, Carrie is a very interesting artist in that her background is she was a college athlete on the Yale University volleyball team. 
and she graduated from there with a degree in physics. Then did a stint at NASA as an intern for them and went on to Microsoft and worked for them for a while and then decided to become a full-time artist. Mm -hmm. And she does photorealistic work. And um, go on our Facebook page. We're revealing her 10 hidden images in that poster. Uh -huh. And so we're inviting people to go there because some of them are, are so... There's some sports team uh, logos in there. There's her father's uh, name in there. There's um, uh, all sorts of different little items. So you'll have to go and see if you can find them. And with that, it would be my pleasure to present. Iris up front. Oh, I'm right Come there. on. I'm not blocking you, am I? Let me see. Right. Where am I? Oh, that's perfect. No, you're fine. Okay. Hey, one, I covered my face two, three. <laughs> well, this is going that way. But <laughs> Booster seat to step on so you can cover me. No, and no, 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 I just fall off. All right, thank you so much, Cindy. Item B tonight is the Skagit Valley Clean Energy Cooperative Presentation. And this, a little bit about these folks. If Peter wants to help them come on up to the podium, that would be great. Um, we have Terry Nelson and Greg Whiting, if that's what I've got correctly, and potentially someone on Zoom, maybe Ben from <laughs> Olympia. And um, I learned about the this cooperative group through a presentation to the Skagit Council of Governments, and I thought it was very interesting. Uh, Skagit Valley Clean Energy Cooperative is a nonprofit organization working to steward an equitable and accessible transition to clean energy. They're partnering with Olympia Community Solar to support homeowners and small business here in Skagit County. And so I invited them to share a little bit about what the work they're doing um, with our community. So welcome to Terry and Greg. Well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, you kind of <coughs> said everything I was just going to say. But oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I appreciate that very much. Uh, the Solarize program is a program I'm very impressed with that, that Olympia Community Solar has been doing for a couple of years. And uh, uh, Greg Whiting, our uh, associate here, is, a very, is an actual bona fide expert in the energy field and has been making the presentations for us. So I'll let him go over the details with you. We also have brochures and cards here which has most of the information you need to know about the program. But awesome. I'll let Greg take it from here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, thank you very much. And uh, so Skagit Valley Clean Energy Co-op, as uh, Mayor Boudreau just uh, uh, said, is a, a nonprofit that's been founded to uh, accelerate the use of clean energy technologies in Skagit County. Uh, the first major program that we've got is the Solarize program. Uh, it's a nonprofit co-op that people can join as members. The purpose is more or less the same as it is with other co-ops, like the food co-op. Uh, you join as a member, and then you get access to uh, things that you wouldn't necessarily get access to at prices that you wouldn't necessarily be able to get. So the Solarize program is one that uh, Olympia Community Solar, which is another nonprofit, has been running uh, down in the uh, South Sound area for the last couple of years with uh, success in uh, accelerating the installation of uh, solar panels on people's homes down there uh, with hundreds of successful installations so far. And what we're doing in Skagit County this year is partnering with them uh, to uh, bring solar panels uh, to Skagit County residents at a lower price uh, than they would otherwise be able to get. Uh, without going to all of the trouble that you would usually have to go to to find a contractor and do the research to understand what happens with solar panels on your house. Uh, so we've pre we have pre-qualified uh, three very, very well-qualified uh, veteran contractors who have experience in uh, installing solar panels in Skagit County uh, and 
pre-negotiated with them, essentially saying, we're going to bring you a group of hot leads. Uh, you give us a better price than you would normally give uh, to uh, to people. And so we've uh, negotiated about a, a 10 to 20 percent price uh, decrease with them relative to what you would normally pay. Uh, and uh, how it works is uh, pro potential uh, potentially interested people go to the Olympia Community Solar website uh, that has been set up specifically for this purpose and sign up. And then one of the three contractors will uh, call you to set up an appointment, uh, no obligation to come look at your house and uh, tell you what it, would, what it would take to install solar panels on your house and to uh, how much it would cost, uh, go through all the details of how to inter, uh, interface with the utility and uh, take advantage of the net metering program that's available, which I'll get into in a moment. Uh, and it's essentially a turnkey uh, opportunity to uh, have a qualified contractor come out, look at your house, offer you solar panels at 20% uh, below the cost that you would normally get, uh, and then also take advantage of a couple of programs that are available right now under the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, there is a 30% uh, federal tax credit on the solar panel installation, so uh, uh, you get a uh, more money back in the first year than you're going to spend. Uh, there is also, uh, I assuming that you use the financing program, which is also a part of the program. Uh, so you get um, the qualified contractor to take a look at it. Uh, if you decide to proceed, uh, then the, you will install solar panels. Um, you will participate in the net metering program. The net metering essentially uh, pays you back uh, over the course of a year uh, for the uh, energy that you generate. So you generate energy, Puget calculates how much energy you generate in the summer. You generate more energy in the winter. Obviously when it's darker you generate less energy. Uh, and uh, during the periods of time when you're generating more than your home actually uses, you accumulate credits that are then applied against your bill during, during the darker period of the year when you're not generating as much as your home would actually use. And they have a true up at the end of, the, uh, at the, uh, end of spring every year. Uh, and then, uh, so the cost is lower, you get the federal tax credit, you have the financing option, uh, and then on top of that, Washington State right now has no sales tax on solar panel installations. Uh, so financially, you have the advantage of uh, lower, uh, lower, cost, uh, lower cost through the federal tax credit, lower cost through the um, uh, Washington State incentive, and then uh, essentially you can get your bill as low as the Puget connection fee if you install uh, enough solar on your house to actually generate as much as you use over the course of the year. Uh, again, no obligation at all, so uh, this is a uh, opportunity the co-op has put together to uh, make available to uh, Skagit County residents uh, an opportunity to just have somebody come out and push the easy button on getting a solar installation on your house. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a quick summary of the program, and uh, what we would appreciate very much is for uh, City Council to essentially s uh, allow us to uh, communicate with Mount Vernon residents about, uh, about this program and tell them, hey, this program exists. Uh, City Council has uh, seen it and thinks that if you're interested, it would be something that you should take a look at. And, and Terry, anything further? Uh, well, yeah, in, in, in an effort to, to further that, we, we'd appreciate it if we'd be able to insert a flyer in your utility bills, things like that, to get the word out, maybe post things on your website, and get the word out to your folks. It's really a great opportunity, and the contractors are very reliable, so there shouldn't be any of the issues you were mentioning previously. So, okay. And then I think we have Ben Seleski, I think, uh, online, if he wants to say anything. Or you, who Peter, was planning on Yeah, you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. go ahead, Ben. Hi. Uh, yeah, Ben, I'm the program director at Olympia Community Solar. Uh, yeah, I just the other thing I will add. Uh, this is something that has been run very successfully down in Thurston County uh, for the last three years. This is our third solarized program. We partnered with cities all over Thurston County, like Olympia, Lacey, Tumwater. Uh, Shelton, Tenino, Centralia, um, and up in Skagit County, the city of La Conner, you know, recently decided to insert some u utility mailers in there. And so, uh, you know, partnering with cities is something that we've done for the past three years now. It's a really, really great way to get the word out um, to all these residents. Uh, and it's a really great way of fulfilling a lot of climate and clean energy goals that cities have. Um, as far as like promoting the use and adoption of clean energy without necessarily promoting a particular business. Uh, and so, yeah, this is something that many other cities down in Thurston have done and really appreciate your opportunity to listen. All right. Thank you, Ben. All right. Yeah. All right.
Thank you so much. We'll Boys, ask if I'll the council has any questions before you step away. And we'll take some of their brochures and make sure council gets sure, all the information. Leave them on the table over there, okay? Uh, maybe the clerk right there could just grab them. Oh, okay. and Yeah. Thank you very much for coming up. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you for the work you've done to form the, a collective and a nonprofit that helps uh, mm -hmm. consumers. So appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right, item C tonight is a parks, recreation, and open space, or a pros plan update. And our parks and enrichment services director, <coughs> Jennifer, is here for this. Jennifer. Give me a moment. It looks like it's working. All right. Well, good evening again, um, and here to talk to you again, bring back to you the pros plan and let you know where we're at and what we're doing with the pros plan. Um, so just for a little refresher, our pros plan is our parks, recreation, and open space plan, and it's a six-year strategic plan that we use to... Oh, okay. Full screen. Okay, there we go. She helped me out. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, our Parks, Recreation, and Open Space Plan is a six-year strategic plan that helps us with um, our planning as well as enhancing our park spaces, our open spaces, our trails, recreation programs, community events, all those things we take a look at when we're looking at our pros plan. The plan, when it's certified, is um, going to make us eligible for RCO grants that come through the state. So it's important for us to um, get our plan um, certified, get it operational, and then keep it going. So every six years, we should be updating that plan. And in December, count, we were here at council, and we were able to talk with you guys about um, just the overall process. Um, the demographics that we had learned at that point in time, and then we informed you of our community survey. So this evening, I have Tom Beckwith with Beckwith Consulting here to give you an update as to what we've been working on and where we're at so far, and we'll go over community survey information, um, and we'll have some more demographic information for you, some um, five-minute and ten-minute walk view work walk sheds um, information so we'll kind of walk you through it's a lot of information but we'll walk you through it at any time please stop us ask any questions that you might have Good. Huh? so you can just um, I think you can arrow down yeah oh cool yeah this one works this one works <laughs> Thanks. Um, the things in the boxes are the things that we've completed so far uh, we've done the outreach surveys. We're going to show you what that is. We've done demographics. We're going to look at the demands, and we're going to look at some draft kind of citywide plan elements uh, that we're working on right now. We showed you this uh, population projections. The Washington State Office of Financial Management does the population projections about every six years. This data is from 2018 projections. We understand that they're about to, to um, publish some updated uh, projections this year. They will show the growth a little bit less than what they anticipated before because of COVID impacts. There wasn't as much job creation. There wasn't as much mobility in the labor market. That may or may not, uh, as the counties allocate the growth within the county, they're going to probably take a look at what the cities can achieve, and so they may not be proportional to each city. You may. You may retain a higher growth rate simply because you have capacity. This is your, what we projected for your age spread by 2050. Uh, that will probably be somewhat similar. What we may just have is a smaller number of people in each bar. But you're still going to be a family kind of um, community, but you will have a growing elderly or senior citizen population, as every other city and place in this state is. Your demand projections will probably be similar to this. We use 26 data for this. RCO does a, a detailed uh, diary survey every six years, and the 2006 was the most accurate. But they have also done some 2017 projections, and we will probably update this a little bit uh, if we can. 
it probably won't change the major findings that fitness, playgrounds, uh, walking, and um, observing wildlife are still going to be the major activities, and those are the activities that your park should uh, begin to focus on. This is the resident outreach survey. That's 625 completions. That's 625 households. So if you were to multiply that roughly by three, you'd have some idea of what the population number is it's, that was recruited. These are the main characteristics. The major recruitment, 73% was by email, 25% by word of mouth, 22% by Facebook, 10% by website. Remember that because when I show you how school students are recruited, we're going to have entirely different sources. <laughs> uh, residents, 19% said they don't live in the city. Uh, it's not unusual for people not necessarily to know whether they are city residents or not, but it's significant nonetheless that they identified and took the survey. Uh, lived in the city, you can see 44% over 16 years, but uh, there's a good spread amongst all the other um, year categories, including 13% that have lived here for less than two years. So we have a good balance, at least, of, of how long they've been residents. By household size, 37% are two-person households. That reflects young people and older people, empty nesters. 91% um, were just a one-person household. And so that's a demographic to pay attention to. By age group, there was a good spread. 30% were in the 26 to 40 or the middle family ages probably with kids. And so we're going to reflect their uh, interest. But 2% were from 19 to 25. So we did pick up uh, somewhat of a balance. 10% said they had a disability that affected their ability to access physically a park or program. And some of their accommodations is 43% would like hard surface trails so they can maneuver on those. Uh, and 11% would like ADA playgrounds. Now, all of your playgrounds have ADA qualified equipment. Probably one of the, the trends or one of the um, newer innovations is what's called the universal playground. And that's where you can play on the equipment if you're in a wheelchair or if you're a physical disability. And that might be something for us to look at. By language, only 3% said they were Spanish speakers. But frankly, even though we had a Spanish version and recruited that way, what usually happens there's somebody in the household that speaks English, and they're the ones that does the survey itself. It doesn't mean we shouldn't reach out in Spanish, but we don't find that, that they actually um, participate online in their native language. And last for gen gender, 69% were female. Women feel, are more diligent about filling out surveys. Uh, but wait till you see what the school student survey looks like. <laughs> These are some of the major um, characteristics, or some of the, how often do you use the following parks? Uh, and I have to read a little bit off of yours because of my menu here is, is uh, sits right over top of that, unless you can. Does that help? No, I can't see. No. <laughs> That's <laughs> all right. Little Mountain. I don't have my glasses on. Little the, Mountain, Baker View. Yeah, the key, key parks they use is Little, little Mountain, Baker View, Edgewater, Hillcrest, and Skagit. Those are your community and regional parks. That's not unusual that they would do that. But if you look down through there, there's a use of almost every one of your parks, but proportion to what they are. If they're a neighborhood park, you're going to have less volume, but it does show that all your parks are, have some activity on them. When we asked for the trails, the trails were Little Mountain and Skagit Riverwalk. Mm -hmm. That's not unusual. Those are your premier trails, and those have the most environmental characteristics in which to observe. When we asked what would you do, increase your use of parks, uh, I highlighted again in the yellow areas. One of them is better improvements. Um, um, the route to the park, one of the qu questions is how do you get to the park and, and how you access it? And the next was a park or trail um, improvement on it. When we then asked how important are the following features, there were trails and open spaces, walking paths, and picnic facilities. Now, in some respects, those are the classic either neighborhood park, what you can walk to, or your ability to get on a trail or something to take you somewhere else within the city. And Jennifer, we, I'm, I'm going to assume we'll have the slides put in the council drive so yes. they can look at them. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, when we asked how important are events, and this is interesting, almost all of your events had significant importance to them, walking and running music concerts, festivals, and farmers markets. Mm -hmm. And so in some respects, the events are as much of an activity as the year-round <coughs> programs that the departments tends to host. 
because these are not only for residents to be involved, but these are also reach outside the city and even bring in tourists. When we asked what would we invest more money in, it was build more trails, build and add new parks, add a greater variety of parks, build, host more community events, take care of the forest, and increase routine maintenance. So pretty much everything within that category they would invest in, which is significant. Now, when we look at school students, we had 743 completions. <laughs> That's probably the highest student participation we've had in surveys. Uh, probably the big, biggest. Next biggest would be Vashon Island. Um, but you have a much bigger population, and we focus primarily on middle and high school students. We don't survey elementary kids. That gets a little dicey with school districts, and parents get a little nervous. So this is middle school age and up. So by age, you can see 33% were in the 13 to 14, 26% in the 15 to 16, 25% in 11 to 12, and we even had 2% under 10. By gender, male and female are balanced. See, we got 50 bucks on the line, and so everybody's into the action here. <laughs> For school, you can see that high school was a major recruitment source, but so were the middle schools in the proportionate size. How do they get to school? 35% by bus. 33% family drive, 12% walk, and 1% bike. Those percentages should be higher if we had connected routes across the city, and that would be one of the objectives in the plan. Years lived in Mount Vernon is really proportional to their age, but you can see that there are some that have lived here less than a year. So there we have newcomers as well as kids who've lived here for quite a while. Now, <laughs> best way to communicate, 63% text, 48% cell phone, 19% chat, 18% Instagram, 17% friend, only 14% email. Mm -hmm. So if you want to talk to a kid, you don't use adult um, <laughs> communication <laughs> techniques. Some of the things we did ask is, where, what would you most like to do? And the numbers here relate to the number of kids said they would like to do these activities. And this would be activities with your city parks department. And I can't read the very top one there, can Art, you? Art, paint, and ceramics. Right. Art, paint, and ceramics, which is interesting. That's art outreach, and I don't know how much art there is in your schools right now, uh, but I was on the board of Mona, and we found that that is a major growth and a major outreach potential in all languages and all uh, ethnic groups. Uh, basketball, photography, self-defense, soccer, and volleyball. Now, you can also see, though, there are green bars and everything, and that's a challenge for the department. How can we maintain that many a number of activities? And if so, or if we have to cut back, then which ones do we focus on where we have the most interest? We asked what city, what parks did they use, and pretty much the same kind of community and regional parks by volume at least. But like the adults, they're in every single park within the city based on its size and its neighborhood proportion. We asked which trails do you use? In this case, they use a little bit more. They use Hillcrest, Kiwanis, Colson, and Little Mountain because those are more accessible to them if they're in a the neighborhood or they're gonna walk or they're gonna bike or they're gonna do the, these things on their own. So one of the objectives as you see is to have an interconnected trail system throughout the city so they can go anywhere once they get on the, on the trail network. What is your favorite park activity? It's hiking and walking and meeting friends. And we didn't put just hanging out, but when we asked the kids, hanging out is what they like to do. And then of course, that's a very nebulous kind of <laughs> description, <laughs> but that's what kids do primarily. So they go to the park to be there. And once they're there, they may engage in an activity or they just may meet their friends. So parks are important gathering places as well as, as uh, organized activity. What facilities would they add? They would add more trails again. They would add sports courts. And we'll explain sports courts later, but that's to be multi-use courts that do more than just say basketball or tennis or whatever. Uh, athletic fields and then dog parks. And this was interesting that the kids had a, a much more focus on dog parks than say the adults did. Mm -hmm. uh, what limits your involvement? The, uh, one of the key issues is unaware of events. And that seems to be true in every city that people aren't connected at least, or they're not aware that they can be connected to find out what is available and what they want to do. The next would be they're not interested in it, of course. And then the other uh, key issue is schedule conflicts. One of the major approaches being debated by recreation departments is do we do a catalog and put out and say, these are the times that the, that the activity is going to be available. 
or do we put out and say, what do you want to do? What times would work for you? We'll schedule around when you're available to do that. Now, sometimes schedule conflicts, though, are kind of a misnomer to say, I just can't get there. I'm not really all that interested in making the effort. So you don't want to read too much into that. The last thing we asked them, we've been asking more and more when we talk to youth, and that's what's, what would you most, what do you currently do? What would you most like to do if you had the opportunity? So you can see the green bars, what they do now, and they have social connections and they network and they participate. But the blue bar says they would like to do a lot more of that. But the other two bars are public service and jobs. And you can see how big those blue bars are that they would like to be involved in, in public volunteer activities that works right <laughs> into the parks department. And they would also like a job. <clears throat> even more so. So I think that the, the idea that our youth are uninterested is not really true, as you can see from this survey. The question is making opportunities available for them. Now I'm going to take you through a real quick <clears throat> inventory of what we did. These are your 27 parks. The numbers correspond to what the green issues are on, on the map. You can see the biggest parks there, of course, are Little Mountain, Bakerview, Hillcrest, and, and um, Edgewater. Mm -hmm. But you also want to look, take a look at the fact that most of them are in this cluster and there are areas in here where there aren't parks. And that's going to show up, the significance will show up a little later. These are the, the county and state. The primary ones are the play fields around the college. And of course, Fish and Wildlife has this Bud House access at, at the uh, far reaches of the river. And there's uh, Big Rock, although Big Rock is technically closed. It's a conservancy. It doesn't have developed facilities. But it is used for trails, and it is, is quote, um, open, even if, it's, does has, even if it's not officially designated as being open. These are the Mount Vernon School District properties. We've also included on here ICRS and Mount uh, Vernon Christian. Uh, you can see their distribution is a little bit better, but of course in there we have the same kind of blank area in between. These are your HOAs. There's a cluster in this area, and there's a few in here, and there's even one down in this area. HOAs are a little bit difficult. Um, they do reduce your development costs and maintenance costs, but they they're, they're only accessible to the people that are part of the HOA. And one of the problems is that the people that who remain outside the HOAs Usually there's not enough of a volume of them to justify adding another city park. So they're kind of in a no man's land and figuring out how to best to serve them is an is a open question. Mm -hmm. And these are the nonprofit facilities, the YMCA's, the Boys and Girls Club. And probably the unknown uh, question is what happens to Eagle Mount Golf Course since it's been closed and purchased by a religious organization, but it has significant amounts of open space or golf course, whichever you want choose from. These are how they are arranged within the downtown area and you can see you have a lot of significant park and facilities within this zone as significant as it should be is this downtown area and the question is how to get access to these facilities from the rest of the city and and between them when you're within that area. Now we're going to show oh these are your existing on and off road trails and you can see you have Colson, you have Trumpeter, but we don't have a network of trails. And that's the objective. This is your five and ten minute walk. The dark gold color is five minutes, the yellow color is yellow. This is only parks, and this is only to the entrance of a park. Sometimes you have major properties like Baker's View, and, you, and you, uh, if you're on the north side of it, you can't enter the park. So if we measure the time distance from wherever the routes and the sidewalks and roads take you. And you can see there are blank areas in here, as we've talked about, uh, where there aren't facilities. This is the same thing if we add the schools, and we assume that the schools are also accessible. Now the pattern is a little bit better, and the question is how best to make use of what the school facilities are and your facilities uh, so that we're not duplicating and we're specializing. This is what's called social equity mapping. This is single parent households. The dark color is over 30% of the households in that area are by one adult, male or female, but predominantly female. You can see where they're clustered, older sections of town. This is housing expense. The darkest color, they're paying over 40% of their income for housing. 
HUD says you shouldn't be paying more than 30 percent. So there's some of the same areas as we just looked at single parenting. This is poverty. The darkest color is over 12 percent are in poverty status. You can see this is somewhat similar to single parent and it's a correlation. correlation. This is non-English speakers. The darker color is over three to seven percent. And you can see the older areas, older neighborhoods is where um, migration typically enters a city. And this is the composite. And you can see all those, most of those characteristics are correlated together within that zone. The question that for parks development and for recreation programs is to make sure there's equity that these people can participate the same as those that can afford it or that have better access. Sometimes that's a question of fees, sometimes scholarships, and sometimes it's simply outreach that they can then get to the parks <clears throat> and the facilities you want them to be able to access like anybody else in the city. Now I'm going to show you very quickly some um, of our citywide kind of inventory and assessments. This is waterfront access, and on the very bottom is kind of the code. So we looked at where the boat ramps, the hand carry launches, and the waiting and fishing areas are. And what we're proposing to consider, something up here off of uh, Hogue Road to provide another access to the river where you could um, launch a canoe or you could fish. So that we have a, take as much advantage of your riverfront as we can. These are the picnic facilities. You can see the distribution is pretty good. But there are orange, we plotted, as you can see, tables and shelters. But you can see that we have some orange here. The orange is what we're proposing. And that's to fill in those gaps where there isn't anything, as we've, we saw from the inventory from before. Now, a lot of those are to be determined, meaning we have no idea what the site would be or, or uh, any particular property. And the issue is simply we know we need something within that general area. <coughs> These are the sports courts. And what we're looking at is basketball, pickleball, tennis, volleyball, disc golf, and skate park. In years past, we used to develop dedicated courts, so it would be a basketball court only, or it would be a tennis court only. And what we're doing now is saying those courts should be multipurpose, so that if you go there, you can play whatever you or someone else is interested in doing. And it's not that expensive to have a basketball standard on the same tennis court that you're playing on, or a pickleball court. Not all of them have to be full size. We find that we can do pickleball and even a half court basketball in about the same uh, overall dimensions for just for the same cost that you would build for just one of those by themselves. These are the athletic fields. Now the distribution reflects schools and where your larger parks are. They do not have to be distributed like we would be looking for playgrounds and picnic facilities. What we'd be looking for is capacity, safety, and security. And so we've looked at baseball and softball, soccer, football, and track. In the old days, as I said, uh, we would build dedicated facilities. What we're looking at now is what we call rectangular fields. So you can combine soccer and baseball. And the baseball uh, skinned areas outside the soccer boundaries. And we're looking at synthetic uh, turf and lights where that's feasible within the neighborhoods. What you don't want to be is in the real estate business. You want to be in the use business. So the multi-use fields are more practical. You can be used all year round, and actually over the long term, they're, they're more cost effective than trying to do dedicated single grass fields scattered throughout the city. The only areas that we had looked at, we did look at Mount Baker Middle School, and we're also looking at Hillcrest, and Hillcrest that may be overlaying some of the fields, and in some cases, as an Edgewater, upgrade the existing standard. Now, a lot of cities, we've, um, the cities and the school districts have coordinated and worked together primarily the question is what are the safety and security issues on the elementary fields because they're the practice fields and what you want to do is get the kids on the practice fields to reserve the competition fields for as much of the play time as you can and oftentimes those those fields are large enough in overall area but they're not particularly in good safe playable condition so sometimes there are joint ventures opportunities for that these are your indoor facilities you have a plethora of them so it's not like you need to have new places in which to meet. And the only question is, particularly like in the school districts and in the, even in some of the HOAs, are they available to the public and are they reasonable? But you have plenty of capacity. These are the special facilities, the community gardens, the dog parks, the pump tracks, the splash parks, and the disc golf. And actually, these are some of the fastest growing activities in the inventory. 
So one of the questions is, are they available? Are they, are they appropriate sites in which to put them on? And one of the areas, proposed areas would be in Bonnie Ray Park, and the issue there would be, can we provide some kind of improvement <coughs> that fits the natural areas of the park and the natural areas activities? Now, these are the on and off road trails. And when I say on and off, because in some cases, like Colson and Trumpeter, they are off road, and that's preferable if you can do that. But we do need to connect those links. We, you need a um, east-west grid, and you need a north-south grid that connects as many schools and as many parks as you can. So that we will have to take advantage, in some cases, of sidewalks and road shoulders in which to do that. This element we usually see incorporated into your comprehensive plan because that gives you standing. So if a development comes in within an area that you've already designated, you have an objective of having a, a trail corridor, then you have the ability to talk to the developer or the landowner about when and where that would be. And we do preface that this is a concept, and it's, it, it depends on further consultations with the property owners and the, and the people that are going to use it, so they're not to be read as as-built plans. This is what it looks like in the downtown. What we're trying to do is go from Lions Park all the way through the Riverwalk and then make use of the dikes on top, and then also on the inside dikes that would take you through Edgewater and on out to the Spud House. Now those docks, uh, those docks, those levees are outside city limits, uh, and actually they're used now, even though they're not designated. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues with the dike districts is are they formally designated or not? Most dike districts are really leery of the liability uh, not that somebody would be hurt on their dike, uh, and the only way that you can have them publicly uh, designated, signage and on maps and so on, is that somehow there's some arrangement about sharing that liability. Some of the dike districts have been more open to that than others, uh, but it's an increasing trend that they're gradually becoming more aware that there are benefits for them doing that. Either way, they're currently used in an undesignated capacity. Now, the other issue is how do we link Edgewater to Riverwalk? And I know at some one time there's talk about trying to put a pedestrian bridge across here, and we did take a look at that. One of the issues would be the bottom of the bridge would have to be above the highest high water um, mark on the river and not be an obstacle. That would put the bulk or the bottom of that bridge in eyesight. You'd be standing on Riverwalk looking at the bottom of the pedestrian bridge. It would also have to be ADA, so you would have ramps on both sides of the river in which to do that, and that would be another visual uh, impediment. And on Edgewater, you'd probably be standing there all alone once the floodwaters come through the rest of the park. Lastly, it would be on the city's dime that would not be eligible for federal or state funding because it's not combined with another transportation corridor. So our, our solution is to stick with the existing bridge and we think that bridge is probably going to be redeveloped sooner than what we've anticipated before with the Infrastructure Act. And if it's done, then the, the state and federal standards require expanded pedestrian access and a bike lane. The only question is how long that will take. It took a while. What we have <laughs> left is we will be back in a couple months with uh, how these things relate to each park. We will be looking at financing issues. We will be having some open houses. And then lastly, we will have a survey of your voter households to see what their priorities are, not only for improvements, but for financing options. So we weren't looking for any um, action this evening, just to share the information. Um, I will get that uploaded. I had one uploaded in there, but it didn't show some of the markings that we had, and I forgot to go back in when we got the new one. and. Um, put it in there. So I apologize for that, but I will get it in there first thing in the morning. All right. And I assume if any council members have any questions or want different types of input, just reach out to Jennifer. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. And that, that's in our docks or uh, park in the park section. Where you're going to put it into our packet? I can put it into you. Which what what would you prefer? I can put, put it in both. That way they can look I, in their packet for today. I can. But do then that. in uh, in the parks. Folder. I'm sure there's something there we can put in. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Okay. I just wanted to say thank you so much for including the children. Yes, Their absolutely. voice matters, and I think it's great that we had such a great turnout with that. The, I, I have to applaud the school district. They were um, very open to, I talked with Dr. Vivanco, and he opened those doors for us to be able to get it to the junior high and the high schools. So, yeah, 
it was great. And it's great to see their responses and mm -hmm. how it's different, right? And how we need to reach our populations differently. Mm -hmm. It's great. Great. Thank, right. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Uh, item D is a public hearing for street vacations. Wait, do I have that right? Um, yeah, I do. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and Alan Danforth from <laughs> Development Services here for this. Alan. Thank you, Mayor. Hi, Council. How are you doing? Um, so back in January, um, I'd come in to set up a public hearing date for this, and we had briefly discussed the vacation of a narrow strip of alleyway just to the east of 2nd and Gate Street on the south side of Gate Street. Uh, ordinance, I believe it's 3867 tonight, would uh, approve that uh, if, if council so desires after the public hearing. Um, just, uh, just to do a little revisit of, of the area that we're talking about is we have um, a alleyway that goes north-south and halfway up the alleyway there is a four foot jog. Um, I've looked at this with public works and planning and we have no short term or long term plans for the right of way. Uh, we do have potential uh, <coughs> long term plans for the remainder of the alley that will stay in place and that, is, that depends on some studies that public works is doing right now on how to separate the storm and sewer system in the area. So to, uh, to reiterate, I guess, is that in, in general, it's going to be this little four foot strip of, um, of land that we would vacate back to the property owner. Um, and again, this is just a little aerial view of that of that strip uh, right now. The alleyway is not actually used as access in any way, shape or form. There is some parking that goes along in there. And there are two utilities that are located within the four foot strip that will be vacated. So they'll, we will retain an easement for those two, which is, I think it's a Puget Sound Energy and Cascade Natural Gas. Um, outside of that, that's about all I've got for you. Uh, so any questions about that? Any or? questions for Alan on this yeah. particular council action? All right. So then we are required to open a public hearing if there's any comments on that side so open a public hearing if there's anyone would like to speak to the street vacation as presented. If Brian wants to since he's here. I really wasn't planning on this one but if I understood right you're going to give that stretch of alleyway back to the property owners. There are people who park on that stretch of alleyway that is less parking this city is going to have and parking in this city and places is a nightmare to begin with you have empty buildings the old y building the a building on the southeast southwest corner of la venture and college way some buildings downtown i think the city council's agenda sites whatever you want to call it is a bit askew this should be really low on the totem pole when there is a whole lot of other problems number one parking the owners of the property can charge for parking now more money for them less parking for the city it's something to think about all right thank you any other comments on the hearing all right with that, we'll close the public hearing regarding the street vacation. This would be Ordinance 3867 if Council chooses to take action or if there's any questions for Alan. No, I'd just like to say, Alan, thanks for bringing this to us. I know I talked to uh, Director Phillips about this uh, when he was in the other department. Um, and, and uh, you know, this property's been encumbered for the property owner. They haven't been able to do a lot of the things that are required of them to do because of the the uh, alleyway being in the way. Yeah. So um, this is just kind of a really it's a house cleaning issue. It Absolutely, is to get the, uh, the property owner to be able to conform with with design standards. Really. Um, so if there's no uh, other questions, I'd move the adoption of Ordinance 3867. Okay. Second. 
All right, motion by Mark and a second by Gary. Any other questions? All right, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Item C is the public defense contract renewal with Mountain Law, and that's Peter Donovan, our special projects admit manager, is here for this item. Thank you, Mayor. Hello again, Council. Uh, since 2014, Mountain Law has provided public defense services uh, for the city of Mount Vernon that exceed the standards adopted by uh, city ordinance. Uh, recently, the city ex uh, extended an agreement with Mountain Law for an additional three months uh, so that staff could review performance and negotiate terms. The city consulted outside council during that time, and although it was outside council's general feeling that uh, the city of Mount Vernon is likely a, a leader in, in public defense services, it was recommended that staff use state Supreme Court established standards to review Mountain Law's performance and adherence to things like prescribed caseloads, uh, as well as a review of compensation for public defenders within jurisdictions of similar size. So following an extensive look into Mountain Law's practices using those guidelines, staff has determined that Mountain Law continues to provide outstanding indigent defense services despite facing many of the, the common workplace challenges that many businesses face today to include uh, attorney recruitment and retention. The agreement before council tonight seeks to address those challenges by bringing Mountain Law's compensation packages more in line with other firms and jurisdictions with whom they compete for a limited pool of qualified and skilled applicants. Specifically, this is a three-year agreement Year one includes a 10% adjustment to compensation and a one-year continuation of the council approved funding to address the remaining backlog of cases caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and the shutdown there. Uh, in year two, the total contract amount excludes that backlog bonus, if you will. So the total amount in year two is a little bit less <laughs> than year one. And then in year three, a modest 2.5% adjustment to that lowered year two amount uh, has, been, has been added. So the contract has been reviewed and approved by outside council. It's been approved by Mountain Law. City of Burlington staff, and City of Burlington, as you recall, shares the public defense program costs with the city of Mount Vernon at a 60-40. Uh, they are, uh, staff approves of the terms and will take this agreement to Burlington City Council tomorrow evening. And with that, Staff is recommending council authorize the mayor to enter into this <coughs> renewed agreement with Mountain Law for continued indigent defense services. All right, questions for Peter on this item? I have no questions. I'll make a motion that council authorize the mayor to enter into a renewed agreement with Mountain Law for indigent defense services. Thank you. Second. Okay, that's a motion by Melissa and a second by Juan. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Nor motion carries. Thank you. All right, item F tonight is House Bill 1590 funding agreement with Skagit County, and Peter's here for this as well. Peter. Thank you, Mayor. Council, you were recently briefed that Skagit County Public Health funds a number of human services using a revenue stream that's funded by local document recording fees. That funding stream is tied, of course, to the cooling housing market. Uh, and as a result, funding for many uh, of the human services in our area are down by uh, as much as 50% in some cases. At the same time, the demand for funding for human services is increasing. Skagit First Steps Shelter, Martha's uh, Place, Permanent Supportive Housing are two examples of year-round needs that, that are being added uh, in recent years. The city of Mount Vernon is participating uh, along with other Skagit cities in the North Star project and a coordination of gov which is a coordination of government jurisdictions seeking to establish efficiencies in our countywide approach to human services. Other cities in the North Star project are identifying their respective 1590 or that's that's uh, housing sales tax revenue returns as a way to collectively address this shortfall in funding. Uh, for instance, the city of Burlington is considering an agreement to commit $300,000 per year for the next five years, while Cedra Woolley has approved a $100,000 per year for three-year uh, agreement. <laughs> the one-year agreement before council tonight would direct 500,000 of the city of Mount Vernon's 1590 funding to assist Skagit County Public Health's efforts to fund the operations 
of Martha's Place, the 70 unit permanent supportive housing development that's set to open this spring. That bridging this funding gap is, is an urgent need for addressing some of the more complex uh, challenges in, in the community and with some thorough and comprehensive solutions. And because of that, staff's recommending that council would authorize the mayor to enter into this one year interlocal agreement with Skagit County for the purpose of allocating 500,000 in city house bill 1590 funds toward the operation of Martha's Place permanent supportive housing development. Great, questions for Peter on this particular item. We've discussed it in committee, but the public may have not seen those discussions. I think it's important for the public to, to know that these fifteen ninety dollars that are, have been collected are a sales tax that was really put on by the legislature, and is designed to to support um, low income housing and the most vulnerable in our community. So these dollars have been collected. We haven't yet had any need to or any projects to spend those on. So this is just kind of some money that's sitting there. There's a need right now to fill a, a void for uh, basically a one-year period. So by committing these dollars, we're actually going to put 70 residents into uh, into permanent supportive housing. Without these dollars, that ha that housing couldn't open up, and those folks wouldn't be housed. Any other questions for Peter on this? Uh, if I hear no questions or comments, I'll motion for the approval for the city to uh, partner with Skagit County for uh, 500,000 from 1590 funds. Uh, for the operations of uh, Martha's Place. Thank you. Second. All right, motion by Juan and a second by Mary. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries, thank you. Thank you, Peter. That it completes our scheduled agenda items this evening. I'll ask our city attorney if there's a need for an executive session. No. All right, with that then we'll be adjourned at 816.